Hello, good afternoon, guys. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. So happy to be here. I hope you guys are doing great. So we're hanging out today. We're just going to do a quick one and then we will be gone for the weekend. Um, so today we're going to be discussing an interesting topic as usual that has to do with US immigration law. We're going to be talking about how to file, you know, a good application. Um, we're going to be looking more at you know the procedural requirements rather than the substantive okay so what are the things you have to do to make sure you you filed a you know a, a very good application welcome guys drop me a comment when you come and let me know where you're watching from um so first of all let's yeah let's just get into the tea first of all when you're filing any type of u.s immigration application make sure that you know the type of form that you you need to um, use. Um, the first thing is that you need to make sure you're using a correct version of the form. The form must not be outdated. Okay, so it must be a very um, it must be a recent form, and you need to usually get the forms from directly from the USCIS websites because if you get it from anywhere else, they may carry expired forms yes some of the u.s immigration forms are expired so you need to make sure you're using the most current version of the form um let me read a comment and then we can continue this is just a uh alamide adivayo thank you so much for joining alamide i don't know where you are based where are you based actually let me know where you are based um okay all righty so the form must be the correct version. It must not be expired. Otherwise, your, your application is going to get rejected. The next thing is that you have to read instructions. You know, every form has instructions, very detailed instructions. And you need to make sure that you are abiding by the instructions. The instructions on the forms have the same force of law, have the same, same, same force as a regulation, okay? And... So you need to make sure you're, you're following the instructions that you have been given because they are law. So um, that's it. Make sure you use a good form, not expired. Make sure you, you read the instructions on the form. Now let's talk about what it means to actually have a properly filed application. When you're doing any type of US immigration law application, what does it mean um, to say that your application is properly filed? We'll look at a few things. The first thing is that you need to file the application at the correct filing location. Guys, drop me a comment. Let me know where you're watching me from. It's Friday. We're just going to do a short and sweet one and then we'll have we'll all have a great and merry weekend. So the first thing is that file is at the correct filing location. And it, this depends on the type of form. So for example, if you're filing an abuse type of green card, you're going to be filing your application at the Vermont Center. If you are filing, um, let's say a citizenship application, with citizenship, because of the rules and the regulations, you know, with citizenship, you need to um, establish that you have you have physical presence here in the U.S. and you're filing. You've been three months at least at the district in which you're filing your citizenship application from. So, with citizenship application, the correct filing location means where do you live? Okay. So, people who are based in New York, when it comes to citizenship, will file to a certain US, CIS, um, US um, CIS location. People who are based in, let's say, Massachusetts will also file to a certain US immigration lo location. So with citizenship, it depends on where you are based, okay? Um, with other types of filings, such as um, I-130s or petitions for, if you are petitioning for your family member, where you need to send the form to is usually dependent on the type of courier service you are using okay so if you are using um let's say usps or you're using ups or you're using fedex it will tell you um the uscis websites will tell you exactly where your form has to be mailed to remember there are millions well hundreds of thousands well actually i would say millions like hundreds of thousands of people all applying to become green card holders all applying for work permits all applying for asylum and you know all of these people are applying and so they need to have a strategy to sorting out all these mails so if you want to make their work difficult they're just going to deny your application okay so imagine if there are hundred thousand people filing for 
citizenship and 500,000 people filing for, um, let's say, abuse green card and everybody goes to dump it in one location and then they now have to sort out every that's just too much work so what they have done is to you know pre-organize and so depending on where you are based and all of that and the type of application you are filing they'll tell you okay send it to the north send it to the southern part um, of the u.s send it here and then they know that all the applications that come to the north are let's say abuse green cards okay all, all the applications that go to the south are citizenship applications. So things like that, it helps to make that work easier. So you need to know the correct filing location. And then the, the next thing is that, of course, you need the correct filing fees. Yep, the government of, you know, the US government loves their money. So they don't want you shortchanging them. Usually, if the application says, um, you know, $400, you need to make sure it's $400. Um, if it's short by one dollar, your whole application is going to be rejected. Okay. Um, sometimes they'll tell you, okay, don't file with biometrics. You you need to be sure. You need to know the exact amounts because the biometrics are usually eighty five dollars. And so, if you're filing with biometrics, it will be eighty five dollars. Some people, um, very recently, there was um, I think two months ago. USCIS came out with a, a new advisory that look, some people don't need to file biometrics. Like if you're filing an extension and an I-539 for certain categories. So you need to know all of these things because that very little thing can just impact your application. It, it will be it will be rejected and it's just a hassle to try to get it back in. And when we talk about the correct filing fees, guys, you need to make sure that them are used. okay so normally you have about three methods with with which um three methods to pay um for the filing fees the government filing fees you can use your credit card and with a credit card you can use the g1450 that's a form and you need to fill out the details of your credit card and then when the government gets your application they will deduct the amount you can file with a check you can file with a money order and all these methods of payment, you know, have their, I guess, pros and cons. But essentially for things like credit cards, if you're using a debit card or a credit card, you need to make sure that by the time the application gets to the USCIS, there's a money in the account. Because what happens is that you realize that people will, people will go ahead and file themselves and then they forget, okay, they filed. And let's say they have they have $1,000 in their account and the application was, let's say, $620. If you spend $500 and you have just $500, by the time the USCIS is cashing the money, if it's just $500, your whole application will be rejected and it will be sent back to you. Because if the application is $620, best believe they're not going to accept $500 for, to file that application for you. So, um, and the catch is this. When you file your US immigration application, usually they don't cash the money there and then. It takes sometimes a month for them to sort out the applications the application and get to you so once you file it you need to be on standby like you need to be vigilant because they could cash the, um, the money in two months or in six weeks or in one month so between the time you file the application and when they cash it be careful of your balance just make sure that you have enough money but that's why we are there um you know to guide you through these things and um make sure that you have the correct amount because the wrong amount will impact um, your application. Okay. Of course, uh, let me say this also, you can always rectify a rejected. So there's a difference between a rejected U.S. immigration application and a denied U.S. immigration application. Okay. So if your application is rejected, better thank God because a, a rejected application just simply means that you didn't comply with some preliminary you know, requirements. When your application is denied, it has more impact. It has, you know, a more negative sense. It's, you know, it, it's just really derogatory for you because it means that you have not been approved for the benefit. There has been an adjudication on the merits of your case. When it's just a rejection, it's really a procedural error that you can actually rectify and then have them, you know, accept the application and then re-adjudicate it. When, it. when it's a denial also, what happens is that you actually forfeit the application fee. When it's a rejection, normally, you know, you can send it back and then try to have it resolved. Okay, guys, 
I hope you guys are enjoying the legal hangout. Drop me a comment. Let me read some comments here. Olamde says he's based in New York. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you for watching. Mami Ako says thank you. Thank you too for watching. Nanayao Che Ajman says, oh, from Woodbridge. Okay, cool. Right here in my hood. All right, that's good. Yeah, Virginia. Virginians in the house. All righty. And then Aroma GH says Ghana. Oh, good, good, good. My home country, Ghana. How is Ghana doing? I need to talk to you, lawyer. Do you, represent, do you represent clients who reside outside of the U.S.? Yes, I do. I do represent clients who um, I have lots of clients. Um, as you guys know, I'm licensed in Ghana as well as in the U.S. here. So, yes, um, please book a consult and then let's look at your issue and then uh let's see abne do say if he says hi do you work on military app applications yes we do right here so let's continue with the legal hangouts guys drop me your comments let me know if you have questions and i'll do my best my very best to answer them okay that's our number right there so let's continue so when it comes to the correct filing fee the u.s government they don't joke with their money like pay up or just get out of here so make sure that your money is um you know on point and everything is accurate with that of course there are some people that are granted waivers okay so let's let me give an example when you're um you've been, you're an abused you're an abused spouse of a u.s citizen or a green card holder or an abused parent or an abused child of a u.s citizen or a green card holder and you file the i360 um usually the fee would be waived and in some applications also uh your fee could be waived and so if your fee is waived then you don't need to include you know filing fees for that okay um and then next don't forget to always sign your application some of the forms are very complicated i must tell you sometimes you have to do a combination like it just really feels like um, you're, it's a mishmash of forms. So let's say you're filing an adjustment of status application where you're married to an American citizen. You're doing the I-130, I-485, I-765, I-864, um, I-131, um, you know, and then I-138, which is for the beneficiary spouse. So in such an application, right, it's a combo. And what you realize is that some of the applications have to be signed by the beneficiary and some of the applications have to be signed by the petitioner so let's take a look at let's say a um, u.s citizen uh, man who's married to his his wife who's um, a foreigner let's say from ghana so the i-130 has to be filed by the u.s citizen man who's petitioning for his wife i-130 a has to be signed by the beneficiary of the application i-485 has to be signed by the beneficiary of the i-130 application who is also the adjustment applicant you know the i-765 has to be signed by the beneficiary i-864 has to be signed by the petitioner and the i-131 has to be signed by the beneficiary <coughs> i'm sorry excuse me so there's it's, it's a lot of complications and let's take a look at the i-751 removal of conditions with that the you know two people have to sign both the petitioner and then um in that in the i-751 there's a petitioner and then there's the main spouse okay so the two of them have to sign that application if you're trying to remove conditions you the conditional permanent resident you are the petitioner in that application but you need your u.s citizen spouse of course if you're filing a joint application to also sign that application so it's a whole lot of things unless of course you're filing a waiver for the i-751 then you need to you know you don't need his signature or your spouse's signature so proper signature of the applicant and whoever needs to sign needs to sign so there, there's a bunch of things that you need to sign and make sure that people have signed at the right places um, I, I, I've spoken to clients who have messed up because somebody signed at the wrong place and they were actually put in deportation proceedings. Yep. So it's, 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 it's that, it's that crazy because some of the applications are time sensitive. So if, um, whoever is supposed to sign doesn't sign and then, um, you know, the application gets rejected and you're out of time, you know, then trouble may come unless, of course, the person who reviews this is reasonable and feels like, okay, yeah, you know, we can still accept it, but you don't want to play with that. Okay, so careful of all of um, those things. And then Joe Mohammed says, please do share. 
Okay. Thank you for watching, Joe. Abna Edusa says N400 application. Yes, yes. Citizenship naturalization applications. We handled them. And then she says, okay, alrighty. Um, guys, let's get back to we'll be we'll be we'll be leaving soon. And then the last thing also is that you need to make sure that an immigrant visa is immediately available. Guys, drop me your immigration law comments. I mean questions. If you have questions, and I'll try my best to answer within the short time that we have. When we talk about the fact that is an immigrant visa immediately available, hmm, this is a whole nother discussion, whole new ball game, whole new legal ball game. Okay, so um, visas. So let me tell you guys something, right? The number of people trying to come to the U.S. are so many. There are millions of people all outside the gates of the u.s trying to come into the u.s everybody wants to come to the u.s i'm just kidding not everybody of course but many people want to come to the u.s and so what happens is that they have quotas for the visa they have quotas because that's the way they can regulate the number of people who can come into the country otherwise we're going to have an overpopulated country so there are quotas and depending on the category you're filing in there's a quota for you. So a visa has to be available at the time you are filing your application. Okay. So let's take a look at people who are known as immediate relatives. Those are wives or husbands, children under 21 and parents of US citizens. Those people don't have visa quotas. A visa is always available for them when they, when they apply to, you know, try to adjust their status. So, but other people like green card holder spouses or, um, married children of US citizens. Those people are in the preference immigrant category. So with those people, a visa has to be available at the time that they're trying to file to apply for their visas, okay? So you need to make sure that an immigrant visa is immediately available for you at the time you're filing. Otherwise, your application will be rejected, okay? So it says um, if you file and you don't meet these preliminary requirements that we've just discussed then the us uscis will reject and return your application and the application will not be considered properly filed until of course you get your receipt date and it's been stamped and all of that um by by the uscis which has jurisdiction proper jurisdiction over your application okay so what and let me summarize everything here by telling you this when your application is actually rejected and returned you do not retain a filing date and we, the filing date is crucial that's known as normally maybe a priority well a priority date for certain types of applications which are under the preference immigrant so the priority date think of it as a long line the people that want to come into the us they you know they are in a very long line so, that, so there's number one number two number three and sometimes um you may be number let's say number two hundred and seventy five thousand. okay and that number you'll be given a date and that date will be your place in line so the date will be when you properly they properly receipted or properly received your application all the people with dates ahead of you are ahead of you in the queue or in the line okay so think of it that way and so once it gets your turn then you get your application reviewed or adjudicated so when you file an application and it's rejected you don't retain a place in the line that means that your number 275,000, you didn't retain it. 275,001 who comes after you will now take your place. And now you go back to the line. So if you get the rejected application and you now refile, maybe by the time you refile in a week's time, they are at number 500,000. And that's, that will be your place in line. Okay. Guys, I hope I've been able to, um, you know, explain all of this well, and you guys have enjoyed the legal hangout. Let me see if there are any questions that we can take a look at, and then we can, um, you know, round off. Nana Yaoche Ajuman says, I'll be looking forward to your session on just filing for citizenship and what one is supposed to look out for. Great. Thank you. Okay. We'll try to do that soon on citizenship. We will do that. Oh, Kwache Rita says, thanks for the information. Rita, how are you? It's been so long. I hope I'll see you on Saturday at the party. 
Yeah. Okay. So Nanaya Ochiajama says, is there any way to know if these visas um, are available? Yes. So you need to look at something known as the visa bulletin. The Department of State um, every month releases something known as a visa bulletin. And you will see the final action date and the... Um, you see a couple of charts and you know we can talk about that in another video but essentially the visa bulletin will tell you which 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 dates you know which categories are current and then which dates are current which priority dates are current okay so pretty much that's how to know so there's the final action dates chart and there's the um, filing applications chart so the differences in those ones and normally the application the final action dates um there's a fad chart um provides the date when visas may finally be issued so when your priority date is ahead of the of the cutoff date it's a little technical so we will have to do another video for that but essentially um, you, you have to look at the visa bulletin to know um, which category you are filing in and whether your category is current and whether your priority date is current. Okay, pretty much that. And um, Patrick Oado says, what about if your visa is expired? What about it? There, you know, th there may be ways for you to regularize. So um, please make sure you call my number and then we can look at what options are available to you. Um, because it just really depends on, on you know, the type of visa you came in, what has been happening since then. Um, and then we will look at that. Rita said, oh, yeah, you will. Okay, great. We'll see you. Okay, guys, I wish you guys a fabulous and a beautiful weekend. Make sure you call me on 802-7800-564, and I'll be happy, happy to assist you. I represent immigrants in all 50 states throughout the united states and we handle all types of u.s immigration law matters okay so um please make sure you call me to book a consult on my very busy schedule and we will talk again soon have a wonderful weekend guys please be safe bye bye